Hi, I'm Siska Wimenga from the University Medical Center in Groningen, the Netherlands. And I'd like to introduce our paper entitled Analysis of HLA and non-HLA alleles can identify individuals at high risk for celiac disease, which was recently accepted for publication in gastroenterology. Let me introduce you to celiac disease. It's an intolerance to gluten, which is a storage protein found in wheat, rye and barley. Celiac patients are well known for not being able to eat bread, pasta or cereals, but are in fact many other products that contain gluten. Celiac disease is the most common food intolerance in industrialized countries, with an estimated prevalence of about 1%. The only treatment available to date is a gluten-free diet. However, most celiac cases stay undiagnosed, mainly because their symptoms can be rather mild, such as diarrhea and anemia. So a large number of celiac cases don't stick to a gluten-free diet, and they are at risk of developing serious complications, such as osteoporosis, fertility problems, or even lymphoma. Celiac disease is a genetic disorder, and the HLA-DQ2 gene plays an important role. We know, however, that HLA can only explain a small proportion of the risk, and that there must be many more genes present before the disease can develop. My group is studying the genetics of celiac disease, and over the past two years, we've been able to identify some nine genes outside the HLA region that are also important for celiac disease. Although these genes have provided us with some insight into the disease process, we also wanted to see if we could use this genetic information to identify individuals at risk for celiac disease. We feel this is important as early intervention with a gluten-free diet may prevent complications arising later in life. Our aim was to develop a genetic scoring system that could help identify individuals with a high risk of celiac disease. The system was developed by two of my talented co-workers, Jihan Romanos, a PhD student, and Dr. Cleo van Diemen, a postdoc researcher. As you have just heard, HLA is the major genetic factor of celiac disease. So our first aim was to classify people into low, intermediate and high risk groups based on their HLA genotypes. From our study, we showed that individuals with 2DQ2 molecules have an almost 80 times higher risk than someone with no DQ2 whereas individuals with 1DQ2 have an intermediate risk of around 15. So based on HLA DQ2 genotypes, we could classify celiac cases and controls into low, intermediate, and high risk groups. As you can see, most cases are in the intermediate and high risk groups, while the controls are in the low and intermediate groups. But we still had a lot of cases and controls in the intermediate group. So our second aim was to see if we could use non-HLA loci to better classify those individuals. To answer our second aim, we used nine non-HLA loci that were associated with celiac disease in genome-wide association studies and calculated the total allele score per individual. This graph shows that the allele score has a normal distribution, but that cases carry a higher number of risk alleles than controls. We then used this score to determine the risk for celiac disease using logistic regression and adjusting for gender, the study population and HLA risk. This graph shows the risk for HLA DQ2 positive individuals. You can see that those individuals with an intermediate HLA risk who carry 13 or more non-HLA risk alleles have the same odds ratio for developing celiac disease as individuals with a high HLA risk and 5 or less non-HLA risk alleles. This group of individuals with intermediate HLA risk should therefore be reclassified as being at high genetic risk for celiac disease. Our current risk model is mainly suited for high risk families that already have a patient with celiac disease. This is also where we feel the need for early diagnosis is the highest. But before we can use a genetic test like these in clinical practice, we need to improve the model by adding more genes and also some non-genetic risk factors such as the number of first-degree relative with celiac disease, the presence of other autoimmune diseases in the family, and so on. Once we have improved the model, it will be important to test its predictive value in a prospective cohort. We'll do this by following people who have the highest risk of developing celiac disease to see if they in do indeed get it. 
The usefulness of such a test also depends on the ease of intervention and its effect. A gluten-free diet is a safe and feasible intervention. As such, it might even be attractive to screen children born in high-risk families fairly early in life for the celiac disease risk. We also know that celiac disease often co-occurs with other autoimmune diseases, and we know that this is due to the shared genetic risk factors between celiac disease and, for, for instance, type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. It is also known that a gluten-free diet prevents the development of these other immune-related diseases. Having a genetic test for celiac disease may have even broader applications in the future. Please feel free to contact us if you have any questions.